so beautiful. It just sort of gets in your heart, and so everyone that comes here loves it. My father's ashes are scattered off the point, as are many other peoples. Billy and I have been you know, coming out here ever since we started going together, which is six, 50 odd years, and we both enjoyed it. We both love it so much. This is true Australiana at its best. It's something that you don't get anywhere else. You dream of it. You dream of sitting here and, uh, and looking at the ocean. The lifestyle here is encapsulated by the journey here. When you decide you're going to come, you pack up and coming to the top of the hill, then donning the packs and coming down. lifts a bit because you can see the beach. Shack communities built legally on freehold land, non-road accessible and self-governing. There's nothing like them in Australia. Originally, the, uh, the miners from Helensburg uh, lost their jobs in the early 30s. With the permission of the farmer, they were allowed to build shacks down here. They were able to survive off the fish they caught and the vegetables they grew. During the Depression, uh, shack numbers built up. They were the youngies who could walk the furthest who came down here and on the weekends they'd walk home to Helensburg with their washing for their mums to do their washing and come back down on, on Monday and they grew veggies and trapped rabbits and caught fish and lived down here for the course of the Depression. My father came out here from Italy in the early 30s he just loved it out here, so he started to build this. And Dad and Mum and I would leave Helensburg of a Friday afternoon when Dad finished in the pit. And we'd walk from Helensburg to here of a Friday afternoon, stay for the weekend, and then once the sun went over the hill, Dad and Mum and I would walk back to Helensburg. So it used to take us about two hours. Dad and Mum, they used to walk through the bushes track for you there, you know. And they used to have, it, have me on a... They made a wooden thing up and had me sitting in the back and come out of it. Well, I was born in 34, so I'd be about 35 when I first got out of here. We used to have a fuel stove and Mum used to make apple pies and we used to have a little meat, like, safe. meat safe and the canvas would be over the top. Mum would make um, jellies and put them in a jar and Dad would tie them and put them in the creek. Then if you wake up in the middle of the night and the southerlies hit, Mum would wake Dad up to go down and pull our food out of the creek. We all down there with the hurricane lights, retrieving the, the stuff out of the meat safe. You never ever had tea in your 
shack. You would come here, which had an open fire here, and you would have, say, three or four families bringing their own meals, cooking them, and then all sharing at the end. And of a night time, you used to sort of play cards and charades. You made your own entertainment. The land was originally owned by a family and had been leased to a farmer, Bob Gray. So he allowed people to build shacks and they always paid rent to the farmer. So right from the 20s, rent was paid, so it's never been squatters. It was only a very small amount, about one shilling, I think, and he's come around on a horse and he had a, a flagon of rum and he'd start from one end of the valley and work his way around and by the time he got to the other end, he uh, was fairly drunk and people used to trick him by saying, oh, you've already collected my rent, so they'd, uh, they'd actually miss out on having to pay their rent. It was mostly Ellensburg people out here until uh, Sydney mob kind of come in and they used to call on the Sydney slickers. <laughs> was a very much an evolving community where the people from the Berg, uh, they always came down, but the, the Sydney community were mainly a lot of uh, artists and bushwalkers. People could get out of Sydney, get on the train, and then just go bushwalking through the Royal National Park. When the Sydney stinkers got here, well, they didn't mix with the Berg mob. Most of the shacks on this side the hill uh, were from Ellensburg. We didn't mix too well with the Ellensburg people for a start and vice versa because they looked upon us, I think, as interlopers City a bit, slickers. you know. Yes. Uh, but there was a drowning down here fairly early in the piece. It would have been about 1938 or early 39. As a result of that, we decided we'd form a surf club. And then it was then that we started to, that there was more social life. My association with ERA started the year I finished high school, which was 1936. A friend of ours invited Lou Voicey and myself to go down there. We'd never heard of the place before. Lou and I fell in love with it straight away and decided we'd build a shack there. My dad grew up at Coogee and him, Warwick Hilton and Les and Ron Miller and a guy called Desi Pittard came down and these five young chaps at 17 just out of high school built a shack on the beachfront and that shack got to be called Lilliput Inn because all these blokes were not very tall and that shack's still there today and belongs to Warwick and Joan Hilton and their families. The first time when I came to Eura got out of the train at Lilyvale and uh, when I saw these three boys I thought this is marvellous. You know, I was a young country girl had come down to the city and I didn't really know any boys at all in the city. And here I had three <laughs> waiting to take me down to this paradise. <laughs> it was the one thing we used to look forward to, to get out of Sydney. You know, the mere fact of getting the midnight train and getting out choosing the moon, that would be a full moon, and doing that walk, and getting down there and opening it up. And it was just divine. We used to... We used to uh, lie there uh, on yeah. the sand at night, look at the stars, because you can see the stars down there with no <laughs> lights, and we'd sing songs. You know, on the calm evenings, we'd be You'd go for a swim. going for a swim and a nude swim, walking along the beach. There's nothing better than going into the sea naked. But in those days, there was nobody about. Except all you'd see was the horses. So we just went in and thoroughly enjoyed it. coming from the city, 
to hit the top of the hill with the trees and the smells and you could hear the ocean and then run down the, the hill and then to uh, arrive in this environment was something you always look forward to and probably you know could never get enough. The majority of people who came down here, money was fairly tight. They were trying to raise families. Uh, there was uh, only one income. They'd carry their materials down and materials were very scarce just after the war, cement or uh, any type of building materials. My parents, Fred was uh, in the police force. On a Friday afternoon, he used to try and follow the cement trucks around in his, uh, in his police car and then follow them back to where, where the depot was and he'd tell these stories of going in and asking them for a, uh, or putting the pressure on them for a bag of cement. Dad and Hal saw that there was a RAF base being demolished and you could go down and bid at the auction. They went down bid and they bought this, which was a women's ablution block. And they said they'd never seen so many razor blades in all their life and this must have been the, the razor blades from the women shaving their legs. Packed it all up on a truck, which you had to do within 24 hours, and brought it up to the top of the hill where it was hidden in the bush and then gradually brought down and the shack was erected here. This is like a little time capsule. And there are things down here that you don't find anywhere else. They're just things that are left down here. There are magazines, there are old bits of furniture and old technology of kerosene lamps and kerosene irons. And, and a lot of history is, is in this area. It's more or less like camping, really. And just the, the novelty of the kerosene fridge and the, the lamps and cooking your food on a fire or, or on, a, on a little a gas burner or something was always intriguing. First thing I got told was you're not coming down here on your own until you know how to light the lamp and light the bridge <laughs> and then you can come down as much as you want. So that was the first thing I had to learn. The fridges yeah. used to smoke. Sometimes you'd come back from a beat and they just... Oh, you'd wake yeah. up in the morning and it'd be all smoky deep, and you'd be like, oh. And if Dad's had too many beers, yeah. he couldn't light the thing. We're all sitting We're there all little sitting like with torches. Oh, it's a little <laughs> <Or> candles. <laughs> They'd bring the kegs down the, the hill and leave them in the creek all day. He used to have to the keep... old wooden kegs and they'd tie about 20 yards of rope on it and give it a kick, you know, have it tied to a tree and it'd go down and come to a stop and they'd undo the rope and go down and give it another kick. Way to go. Uh, there one time it got away and come all the way down and hit the rocks at the bottom and start all oozing out through the cracks. So they put up on a rock and all went home and got their glasses and went down and drank it while it was oozing out the sides. I've got some photos somewhere of my dad and all the, the men in the valley sitting in the down the bottom near the creek with jugs of beer because the keg had split. So there was only one thing to do, which was drink the rest of the keg there and then. So that's what they did. The piano. The, the piano down. was brought down. <laughs> and we used to have dances by lamplight. We've had bush dances and fancy dresses and... New Year's Eve parties and they do Scottish reels and all sorts of things. We just just a rage around. We'd send up these big plastic kites when there was a howling southerly and we'd have a little parachute attached with another string you'd pull that had a, a frog in a little tin and, you know, the, the frog would float down in his parachute and we'd all race down into the valley to, to see how the frog was. <laughs> and we'd put about 10 kids on this big, long sled almost. The top of the steepest hill, and we'd just take off down the hill. And also, we're always in the water, so we develop really good surf and water skills. We'd put on plays, and it was terrific. It was a great thing for kids to do, and it was, yeah, it was good fun. And there were communists down here, you know, and they were known to be communist. So it was quite a strong homosexual society down here. Looking back on that, you think, well, gee, that's pretty egalitarian, really. There were families, singles, artists, 
Hal Missingham. Um, he uh, was quite prominent down here and he was the, uh, eventually the director of the New South Wales Art Gallery. He uh, brought uh, Max Dupain down and Max uh, took some beautiful photographs around here. Margaret Ollie came down and uh, the Boyds came down as well, which uh, they had a uh, shack on the, uh, on the point called Thalassa. It was a beautiful spot mm. and the, the rugged coastline unspoiled. I think they went there for the same reason we went down there, to get away from it all, from city life, from crowds from having to be a machine in the modern fucking world. Hmm? I often think I'd like to go back and paint that ridge looking down to burning palms, but, you know, in reality, as I'm, you know, now an artist on wheels, <laughs> I don't think I could do it. we own the shack and not the land, we have always had to, in a sense, struggle a little to survive. I grew up with the feeling that when my parents died, the shack would be pulled down. Always feeling as though that we could at any time be pushed out, and it was a great hurt. So that, that feeling that it might not be there tomorrow was, was quite constant. From a really young age, I've always worried. Mum and Dad and aunties and uncles and the community would start to talk about we're going to lose our shacks. And I can remember at a young age that I used to dream that we were going to lose our shacks, and it wasn't a very, it wasn't very nice. In the early 40s, the original owners of the land put it on the open market. It was going to be bought and set up as a um, country club. And so that was very concerning, as you can imagine, to the, uh, the shackies down here then. So they decided they'd try and buy it themselves. We first formed our protection league then and we all put in 40 pounds, which was, I'll tell you, in those days was an enormous amount of money for us. We, per shack? Per shack, it was hard, hard to find. Basically, Hooker, who was behind the big sale, I said, well, whatever money you put up, we'd always better you. We realised that we weren't going to be able to raise anywhere near enough money, so we then approached the uh, New South Wales Lands Department to resume it and put it in the National Park. We had started a campaign. We got Al Missingham, people like this, write letters to the Herald to resume, you know, that we wanted the park resume. My father, Lou Voisey, was one of the people who fought very hard back in the early days of the Protection League to try to save the land from developments. Right up until when he died, which was in 2002, he was still active and writing letters to the minister about what they were trying to do to us then. The Lou Voisey was part of a delegation to the minister to discuss ways and means of saving the land falling in the hands of the developers. And then with the auction coming up in March 1950, there's a flurry of correspondence between the bureaucrats and the minister and the land was resumed and it was agreed that the shacks would stay. So it became part of the National Park in 1950. So where they'd been paying the money to Bob Gray, the farmer, they then just paid money to the National Park Trust. As far as we're concerned, I think started with the surf club. So it would have been about 1938 or early 39. Warwick and was the foundation member. I was a foundation member, and uh, you know you had to get your bronze medallion 
show that she could save someone. It's certainly a very safe beach in terms of surf life savers because nearly every cabin is a uh, surf life saver living in the cabin. Even if they're not still doing patrols, they know how to save someone. They train in first aid and resuscitation and, and surf skills. And they go away on trips to, to surf carnivals uh, together, uh, which bonds people. The surf club was built around about 26 years ago. Most of it was carried down the hill by the members and their wives and kids. I joined the club as, uh, as a young fellow and uh, then just sort of stayed in the club here and did patrols. We used to leave the hotel at 10 most Saturday nights and we used to have some very funny trips down the hill at midnight to be on patrol the next day and it was always a party coming down the hill. By the time we get to the bottom here, it'd be 12 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning. We'd have a big party till 4 in one of the cabins and get up and sit on the beach all day and do a patrol till 4 in the afternoon and have a few more beers and go back up the hill. The surf club's gone from strength to strength and since we've had patrols, uh, we've never had another drowning on the beach in patrol hours. And probably our most uh, famous member was, uh, is Paul Hogan, who as a kid came down from uh, Granville and he joined the surf club. And even today when he bumps people from era, he expresses that he'd you know, love to come back down again and, what great days they were. It's that isolation that really does hit you when, uh, in those days, when somebody became injured. For somebody had, who had to be carried out in a stretcher, that, in, that was a tremendous effort because you'd need about 20 people around that stretcher to carry it. That led to the Bank of New South Wales at the time, which later became Westpac. They would give me $25,000 to establish what was Australia's first civilian rescue helicopter service. Our relationship with the National Park was a bit strained. You know, we realised we were in a national park and we did own the place. And we did, in fact, pay rent to the, uh, the Royal National Park Trust. In 1967, they formed the National Parks and Wildlife Service, which took in all national parks in New South Wales. And that was really the beginning of the very difficult times. The Minister for Lands, uh, Mr Lewis, he had been to America and he'd seen one of the big national parks over there and how that was managed. He brought in a ranger from one of these parks and he became the head ranger here. And basically, he said, oh, the shacks have got to go. We'll bring the bulldozers in and get rid of them. But basically, what they brought in was a licence specific to one person. And the condition was that when that person died, the shack would be pulled out. They were signed under duress because if you didn't sign, your shack was pulled down straight away. And so a number of shacks were lost immediately. Because of my grandparents dying and the parks trying to resume the shacks, we were out of the valley for a little while and that was horrendous to not have somewhere to go to. They put a sign up on the door so, and boarded it to say that it was trespassing. The valley would come over and someone would take a saucepan and someone would take a table and so our shack, our insides of our shack was distributed throughout the whole valley. It was too hard to come down and not have somewhere to go to be your own. That sense that you'd lost something, you know. Pants mate Bob was laughing, all right? Back in the late 60s, I was um, going to Vietnam in the army. My father actually offered to me to put the shack in my name the last time you could transfer the shack in the 60s. I said, well, if I die and it's in my name, I said, you'll lose the shack. 
so we could not tra transfer it. Parents and the valley decided to put on a party for me in the hall. So I told all the blokes in the platoon, I said, what about we come down for the weekend for a party? And I was just turning 20 and it sort of was a half a 21st birthday party and as usual, you, know, you had to hang up from the rafters by your legs and drink a, drink a beer upside down. I remember leaving the place and stopping up on top of the hill and just having a last look at the shacks in the valley because I thought maybe I might see these again. We wrote a letter not long after I'd come back and said about transferring and the reasons why we wanted to transfer it before but we couldn't. But the National Parks just disregarded the letter and wouldn't let us do it. The animosity between the shack holders and parks was very great. National Parks came down and put an axe through our remaining tank. And somebody said, what, what did you do that for? He said, so you bastards can't use it. They put a notice on the door saying that the shack was going to be pulled down, please remove any of your personal belongings. And uh, it, it was ultimately pulled down. There was a period of about sort of 25 years where I didn't come down here as much because I had nowhere to stay. Well, I feel as though I was robbed. What they would do is look at the electoral roll and uh, see if someone had died and actually confront the people in the shack. And we were sitting here having our lunch one day and he just put his head in the window and said, you know, who owns your shack? What right have you got to be here? 40 or 50 years ago, if, if you wanted a shack, all you had to do was come down and get involved with a surf club or a community somehow or other, and, and after a while a shack had come up and you could buy it legally. So the exclusivity is totally a, a construct of the National Parks and Wildlife Service, totally. <laughs> There was always clauses in those leases that said when the current owner dies, the shack gets pulled down. And I guess that's why there's some, some 120 year old people in Elder Valley still, because obviously that original owner hasn't died. Uh, and someone's still paying the rent. So. There was a lot of that. <laughs> One shack blew up one day and it was rebuilt within three days. The owner went up, bought all the material and they just put the whole thing up, exactly the same size, exactly where it was, and you hardly know it was changed. The concern was that if the park found out the shack had gone, then they might not be allowed to rebuild it. So it was like instant rebuild. And everyone, I mean, my kids at that stage, they were teenagers, they were digging bags of sand, carting sand, people mixing cement, people doing anything and everything. There was always that nice community feel about it and people helped each other. I remember when we brought the fridge down, everybody got together and all the men went and carried it down and you know, you don't have to do anything by yourself down here. In fact, if you do things by yourself, I think people think you're being antisocial because they like to do everything as a group. There's a common bond having to share that hill to get in. And basically, if you don't like the hill, you don't like coming down here. Yeah, lift it up and take it to your right. That's it. But once you're down here, you're all on a, an equal level. It doesn't matter what position you are, whether you're a university lecturer, you're head of a large corporation, a builder, you're a plumber. Basically, all those people help each other. Money doesn't buy anything here, so there's no commerce other than bartering and trading and helping each other, which people do, but that commercial world stays away. Dad had about eight mowers at one stage, that he'd be fixing up for different people, and people say, you can have that mower, and that'll fix it up. They do things for Dad as well too. They bring things in for him. I've done a few drawings and logos and get stuff carted in or, or work done on your shack in exchange for, you know, a little bit of artwork. I more started doing it as a family sort of history reference and probably partly out of nostalgia. 
we invest a lot of psychological and spiritual importance, I think, in the, in the places that we, we grew up in, and people remember them very fondly, and there's a quasi sort of religious aspect to it too, I think. There was one particular shack which was quite poignant that was, was actually demolished. Wart wanted to give it to the surf club because he did, uh, he loved the surf club uh, so much. And then the uh, national parks wouldn't let the surf club retain the shack. And they chose to come down when everybody was here. And it was like, you know, it was so... It was in your face. Really. In your face, yeah. so flagrant um, to really upset people, to pull this down while everybody was here. The uh, labourers who came down to uh, help demolish the shack realised that uh, it was Wart Shack and they uh, wouldn't go ahead and, uh, and, and demolish the shack, so the rangers had to uh, do it themselves. It was very upsetting, really. Yeah, we had a beautiful view of the beach. Yeah, big windows view. here, big picture window. Yeah. At the end of our double bed looking out over the beach. It was a really cosy shack in winter. It had a big open fireplace. Our kids loved it. The, the kids always had a, a bet with all the local kids to see who hadn't worn shoes for the longest amount of time, and that was sort of part of being at ERA. We replaced the roof, most of the walls, new windows. The whole place was uh, pretty smart. We had no idea that there was any threat to our shack. We found out, we came down immediately. It was devastating, there was just stuff everywhere. Our daughter's Christmas presents were scattered and we watched on in despair. They circled the valley in the helicopter until they mm. saw where the things were and landed and, and took them. When I was in the Holloway shack putting stuff in the cupboard, the helicopter was outside and they were picking up um, you know, the cupboard or the double bunks or something. And I was so terrified, I dived under the bed. One of the most unforgettable sights was the side of the fridge. It was painted blue and it had a big sort of painting on the side that our daughter had done that was sort of stuck on the side of the fridge and that was sort of flapping as it went up through the air and went off to Gary. They just left the, all the broken timbers and iron just lying there. And in fact, a couple of months later, we came back and, and uh, tied it up. It was just too disappointing. I mean, it was just awful. That was really stressful. So it was like at that point, hey, we've really got to do something about this. This is not good. By that stage, about 50 shacks had been pulled down at the three communities and we had to come up with a means of stopping that. Because it's so much part of your being, you feel as though you want to preserve this particular heritage. It's my heritage, it's my family's heritage. So for me, it's really important to my sense of who I am and my sense of family. I felt very close to my father and it was a fight of my father's that I wanted to take on and I also felt it was just, um, just so important to me. People think that heritage has to be a stone church or, or a, something else or a house, but it, it can be a community as well. So in 1990, Malcolm prepared this conservation report, which we sent to the state government asking for an interim conservation order on the whole of the area. We approached the National Trust and the senior conservation officer came down and uh, wrote a very positive report back. As a result of the National Trust recognising the heritage, demolitions were stopped. So there was a moratorium placed on any shacks being demolished and that was in about 1992 or three. And that was a very important point when we felt we had a stay of execution. We didn't know what was going to happen, but we felt at least we've stopped them pulling them down. 
The week before the moratorium was bought in, there was a shack pulled down in front of us. We spent our honeymoon in that shack and it was a wonderful shack. And, and we loved the family that were in that shack. So we lost the connection to that family as well. People thought maybe there is hope. You know, we, we actually can move forward. You know, there may be some, uh, some hope for our children's generation, their children's generation. Our shack wasn't torn down. To us, it was a miracle. So when we got our shack back, after five years of not having it, all the people who took things brought them back. It gave us that feeling of belonging again. worth putting it in an international context. There are other national parks throughout the world where ongoing human use of the landscape is an accepted part of the national park. I think there's been a slow but increasing awareness that, that the national parks are in fact cultural landscapes that have uh, thousands of years of Aboriginal occupation before European settlement. So they're, they're not pristine wildernesses, they're actually cultural landscapes. And to varying degrees, if, the, if human interaction with that landscape can be understood and, and respected and in, in turn is sustainable and doesn't damage the values of that landscape, then you can have continued occupations. There are some green groups, I think, who would still like everyone out of the park. Mm. They wouldn't like people who even walk through the park, use the park. Mm. But this land's been logged several times. There used to be cows everywhere. This was fat cattle, cattle land. This is dairy land. The connection to uh, the, the whole of the area is very strong. We, we know how the, the ecosystem works here in, in extreme dry and, and, and extreme wet. It's a, a knowing uh, uh, and understanding uh, your place. Now, the majority of people down here have solar, and uh, solar powers all the lights and the fridge. Originally, there were kerosene fridges. And then uh, the water, there's always been galvanised tanks, but now they're plastic tanks. The toilets used to be pit toilets, but now they're just composting toilets or very simple septic tanks. There are a lot of people who actually look after the area. The land care group do um, erosion control eliminating a lot of noxious weeds. Just the physical beauty of the place and the fact that it hasn't been changed by development, to me that is a, a balancing factor um, to learn to love a place as it is and to know it, to know where the sea eagle flies to nest, to know that there's usually an octopus in this pool and that there's an eel over in that one. Uh, not to want to disturb them or move them, but just to know that they're there. We've had some major grants to work on uh, erosion and particularly on fencing the very significant midden at North Era, which is a very special Koori place as for Aboriginal people. With their agreement and so on, we fenced that and marked it and are working on it to prevent erosion. Of course, the Aboriginal uh, history of the place stretches many thousands of years back throughout that landscape down there. In that sense, they're a cultural landscape that reflects many layers of uh, use and occupation. In fact, those open areas where the cabins are built still is largely reflects the pastoral landscape of the late 19th century and early 20th century. Um, so you're having this sort of multiple layers of Aboriginal, pastoral and recreation, for want of a better word, the recreation landscape in the more recent years that are reflected in those cabin communities. They were still working very hard the parks to get rid of this, and some rangers had really taken a shine to achieving their goal.
the year 2000 plan of management came out and said the checks should stay, but there would be conditions. I think it all came to a head round about late 2001 when we were going to be divided into three different groups and different people were going to get different deals. We were called bona fides, caretakers and others. And the others would have to bid for their share in a public expression of interest. And it dawned on us that our neighbours who had been in their shacks for many years might be in that situation of having to bid for a shack against other people and might not get it. And what would we feel like as a community if that were to happen, that our neighbour was kicked out? Could we stand by and watch that happen? The service basically was saying, we will never ever negotiate with you. We will talk to you and we'll let you know what we're going to give you and that's it. In 2005, they came out with a license agreement which was totally unacceptable and said, we'll sign within six months or else. Everybody realised that's not right, it's not fair. And it was then that the Protection League got together and we all had a meeting and then decided that we would have a go at the National Parks because they couldn't make up their decision to renew our leases or not. All the communities got together and said, well, uh, let's get a fighting fund and let's fight the National Park because the National Park was wrong. This was all private land when it was put here. Uh, it's got some heritage on it now, so why shouldn't it be able to stay? Oh, oh I collect the deers back in here. How are you? Oh, oh. I think what is hardest for people to accept is that white folks, European folks, can have a connection to place. And I think that's what we have to aim to have parks understand, that the European cultural heritage of this place is something to be valued and not just to be tolerated. I think the National Park and Wildlife Service got a surprise because they just thought they're a bunch of hicks down there. We'll put this legislation through and get rid of them. And unfortunately, they came across the fact that about a third of the population down here were pretty good at fighting bureaucrats. <laughs> the effect was a unification. Through about 2004 and 5, I think we had big community meetings up at Helensburg where people came together to discuss what to do. There were a few people who balked at legal action. I mean, people had to put in money. We were paying these lawyers, so the first donation was $1,000, and then later we were coming back and we were getting people to sign things. There were $1,000 cheques floating, flying around like confetti, and we raised $200,000. Some people don't have any money. They, some of them gave the most money. So it was an incredible thing to do. It was very, very important for us to hand on this heritage to our family because actually they were just as much part of it. We had three daughters. They've been coming down since before they were born. <laughs> and then they brought their kids down when they were babies. And those kids are now bringing their kids down. I've been coming down since before I was born. Mm. And then straight after I was born, pretty much, and I haven't stopped. Two weeks old. Yeah. As we saw little shacks disappear up and down the coast, that there's also a public sense of retaining a kind of lifestyle that is disappearing from the coast. And about three days before the six months were up, we slammed an injunction on National Parks and Wildlife Service to take them to court. The land had been resumed, but we felt we had clear evidence that the shacks had not been resumed, but would a court of law find for us or not? The service, uh, I think, sort of looked at our points and thought, ooh, ooh, <laughs> we could lose this. <laughs> Uh, and that would reflect on them big time fans. So they suddenly said, oh, we want to negotiate. The lawyers advised us if we could get a mediation going, that that's what we should go for. 
a mediated settlement. There were three fairly strenuous mediation sessions and you'd be sitting there and they would come in with something way off the planet. At one stage it was something like, you can own the shacks, but then you'll give them back to us and then we'll do this. We went, well, we'll know. Helen and Boise and I are back in court to get a date for the hearing and the National Parks and Wildlife Solicitor comes rushing in and wants more negotiation. Finally, at the third mediation session, they said, well, you can have this. And I remember thinking, my God, they're giving us a reasonable settlement. I think we could actually run with this. They ended up giving us a 20-year lease, which we all signed, and I feel that in 20 years, at the end of the 20 years, we'll be back in court. Well, I, and I'm hoping differently. I'm hoping that national parks have now become a little bit more real. A lot of people were relieved because now we're all treated the same. OK, we have to pay the higher rent, but we just feel a little bit more secure. that the National Parks and us would jointly apply for state heritage listing because that was a level of protection that the National Parks could then never remove any more shacks. Even though it was in the mediation agreement, driving them to do something about it uh, was a major issue. There was then a, a sense of, uh, we've been double-crossed here. It was the communities that we wanted to list. And the other thing we wanted was us as the owners in that document. Uh, I wrote this letter uh, in support of state heritage listing for the shacks. My father, Kennedy John Barlow, started building the cabin when he was 16 years old. My brother and I grew up here understanding the beach and the bush, the wildlife and the plants. It's my special place and I've always had a deep attachment to ERA and continue to visit regularly. I'm also a member of the Land Care and I'm passionate about... There are bushwalking groups that come through the park. I ask them if they want to hear the, the history of the valley and uh, we invite people to come into the shacks. Every year there's a Heritage Day and we invite the public to come down to the shacks. The current idea is that there would be a few shacks that are available for short-term public letting. Better camping facilities on the coastal walking track. The social vision of people from many different walks of life all connected by this place. They're attracted by the difficult access as only the fit and the determined regularly make the steep walk into their cabins. I think the National Park has accepted that the shacks are Kind of stay. We're all now paying about $3,000 a year rent and we can't get any money spent to walk down the track. We currently walk up and down all the time so you know I think there is still a lot of work we need to do with the park to get them to realise that you know we are a good community, we are heritage. You know, my opinion this is part of history and I think a lot of people would like to see their kids come down here and see these cabins that were built and how people lived many many years ago. The community has struggled to survive against attempts over time to remove the shacks. It's important for future generations that the shacks and the communities with their distinctive way of life are preserved. They reflect a history of a lifestyle that's disappearing throughout Australia through government policy and changes in the way people have uh, weekenders and weekend experiences and leisure time in general. But I think, to me, it's the sense of connection between people and place that's not equaled anywhere else. It's that fragile little cabins in this beautifully remote and dramatic landscape that I think is, sums up the sort of value of these places. They put the heritage listing on public exhibition and we had more, sub the most submissions they'd seen all year on a single topic. And after this, I remember the lady from the Heritage Office ringing me and saying, we think there is such a strong feeling 
about these shacks in your, for your community and for your group and for people in fact all over the world that this place has a strong and special association for the people there. Attached to this document are the list of submissions. Here they are. These are your submissions. There are pages of them. We're getting good at this, folks. <laughs> These are your submissions, your families, your friends, and those submissions are what got us that listing. And I think we need to congratulate ourselves. And so when the minister announced the communities were going to be listed on the Heritage Register, that to us was one of the greatest moments. We felt really validated that our connections with that place had been recognised. We felt we have a future now. We're looking at a generation ahead in 20 years and they will then take our place. By then, this place will be very unique because of the pressure of real estate on the coast and also I think that the history and, and the uniqueness of this area will save it. My hopes are that we can stay here till our time's finished on this earth, I suppose, and I hope my grandkids and my children still love us like we do and can always use it. It's just been sort of a part of your life, you know. The National Parks head said, well, what do you think is going to happen in 20 years' time? And I turned around and looked at him and I said, we will still be there. Might not be me, but my children and my grandchildren will still be there. Our granddaughter's on the licence and one of our grandsons. And they can, they'll take up the fight, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who knows what'll happen. They might have to go through this whole business again that we went through to, to keep it going. After 20 years, I guess, we'll be fighting the battle. Uh, my kids carrying my case down. Yeah. <laughs> Dad. My father was involved in the first fight, which was to protect the land from development back in the 1950s. I think my father would be proud that his great-grandchildren will be in that shack in the future. <laughs> <laughs>